Elizabeth Stroud is the author of Amy and Isabel, which won the Los Angeles Times Book Award for First Fiction. Her second novel, Abide With Me, was also a national bestseller. Her new book, Olive Kitteridge, is about the extraordinariness of ordinary life in a small town in Maine and an unforgettable title character at its epicenter. Edward Hirsch has written six volumes of poetry and four works of nonfiction, including How to Read a Poem and Fall in Love with Poetry. He is the president of the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation. Meg Wolitzer is the widely recognized author of seven nuanced and sympathetic novels. Her new novel, The Ten-Year Nap, dramatizes how a decision to leave the workforce affects the lives of four New York wives. Mark Sarvis has established one of our most important literary blogs, The Elegant Variation. His tragicomic first novel, Harry Revised, depicts a widower's efforts to reassemble his life and himself. Because all of these novels brilliantly reveal the interior lives of their characters, the title page for this episode reads, Inside Out. Welcome to you all to Title Page. Ed Hirsch, um, your uh, book of poems, Special Orders. Um, the, the theme of this program is Inside Out, and this is a very introspective work, as many of your poems are, many of your, much of your poetry is. But does it represent a breakthrough, do you think, for you? Is it different from the earlier six, as it seems to me to be? I feel strongly that it is a different, it's a, of a different <coughs> tenor, different sort. I would say that I've written poems all along that were very personal, but I'd never read a whole, written a whole book that was so aggressively personal. And that often I'd, um, there's often been a kind of screen or a persona, or I often have worked through different voices. And in this book I try very hard not to do that, to try and, um, you know, lift the blind mm -hmm. and make it more transparent. Would you do me a favor and read the title poem, Special Orders? Um, poets have an advantage here because they can actually uh, read an entire thing in a very short time. Well, you know, you're finally getting paid off for taking the spiritually higher path. <laughs> <laughs> um, the title poem, Special Orders? Special Orders. Give me back my father walking the halls of Wertheimer Box and Paper Company with sawdust clinging to his shoes. Give me back his tape measure and his keys, his drafting pencil and his order forms. Give me his daydreams on lined paper. I don't understand this uncontainable grief. Whatever you had that never fit, whatever else you needed, believe me, my father, who wanted your business, would squat down at your side and sketch you a container for it. Am I right in thinking that that poem is about poetry? Um, it's about a few things, and one of the things it's about is poetry, I would say. I mean, it's also obviously about my father. It's, more, it's a poem it, of mourning. It's, it's, a poem of, it's, it's a poem of great grief. But I would say that, it, and, and, and so first it's about the grief for my father, and. Uh, and, um, and it's an elegy in that way. But in a secondary sense, I would say it's about poetry in the sense that it's about uncontainable feelings and trying to contain them and trying to find a form and a shape for something that is so overwhelming to you in terms of your own feeling that, in this case, grief, but it can be any feeling, really, that is so swamping that you don't know what to do with it. And in a way, I'd say poetry well, literature in general, but poetry in particular is a way to try and contain what is otherwise uncontainable. The book is uh, separated into two sections. More Than Halfway is the name of the first section, and To the Clearing mm -hmm. is the name of the second section. Why the two sections, and what's the difference between them? It's really meant to be a journey, and it's, um, it's, very, it's very palpable, I think, that there's a kind of, it's meant to be a movement through the through the book, and the first part is um, more than halfway. Um, I'm more than halfway to the grave, but I'm not <laughs> half the man, man I meant to become. 
Um, and then, um, and it's, it's, I would say, a little overwhelmed by grief. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a whole section, a very, it's a very personal section, very self-critical section, a lot of self-reckoning. And the second section, to the clearing, is a very, I think, palpable struggle or attempt to move past that. And, uh, and the poems keep moving towards spaces of freedom, to the clearing, to open areas. There are many poems that are elegiac, mm -hmm. even in the second section, perhaps. Um, and the tone of the book is melancholy, even though there are happy poems later on. Did you, were you aware of that? Did you mean that to be the case? Well, I don't think it's a very clear path, I would say. I guess the movement to the clearing um, is filled with obstacles. And there's a lot of, I'd say, backdrop. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, this is a book to me of, um, of middle age or late middle age or moving through middle age. It's not a young person's book. Um, and, um, and therefore, I mean, I do think there's a lot of, there, there gets to be more and more joy in the book, mm -hmm. more and more ecstatic things, more and more pleasure, I would say. Um, but it's a, it's a very adult kind of happiness. Mm -hmm. It's shaded by grief. Mm -hmm. It's shaded by melancholy. It's shaded by what you've come through. Um, you don't ever put it in, you're never totally in, in the clearing. That's why it's not called the clearing or in the clearing. To it's the really clearing. moving to the clearing. Mm -hmm. It's really trying to get to that place. Yeah. There's one poem, um, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's, I guess it's the one called Self-Portrait, very mm -hmm. simple one, in which you talk, it seems to me, about a division between two opposite selves within yourself. Could you tell us a little bit about that theme and how it works in the rest of the book? Um, uh, I like that poem um, because it, it sort of literalizes the conflict. It's, I think it's amusing. So, you know, I, it begins, I live between my heart and my head like a married couple who can't get along. Right. And, you know, your left side does one thing and your right side does the other, and your left arm is like this and your right arm is like that. So, but it just, it literalizes, it's a metaphor. It literalizes in the body the split that's in the self basically. And so, I mean, I, I, it's a book of very aggressive, I'd say, self-reckoning and self-division. And, and interestingly, a lack of resolution, as in that poem. I mean, there's an admission that there may not be a possibility of... Well, in, in that poem, the only resolution is in the grave. In the grave. It goes, Where the left know, hand and right hand... My left hand will be crossed in the coffin, right and, right. you know, I'll be reconciled at last, I'll be whole again. I realize, as often happens in, in these conversations, I realize suddenly that all of your books are about the same conflict between the heart and the head to some extent. Well, I said in, early in the green room that if, if Ed's book had been out at the time I was writing mine, I could have used the line that he mentioned earlier about I'm not half the man I meant to become as the epigraph of my own story because yeah. it really resonated beautifully. And I, I love that the, the closing image of the collection um, when I would say you or the character, however one would prefer. It's pretty close is, to me. To use is, off in the water, and that is, there's a sense of resolution or the promise of resolution in that moment. Liz Strout, Olive Kitteridge is the central character in this book, although not in every one of the stories. Tell, tell us a little bit about who she is and what she worries about. Well, she's a woman who's um, in her later years, and she's, she's lived through um, a, a particular life of being a school teacher in a small town in Maine, and she's She's terribly opinionated. She's, I think, in many ways quite difficult and yet hopefully quite compelling. Her son uh, leaves town and uh, goes off first to California and then to New York. And if, if for somebody like Olive, who's living in this small New England town and has lived there for her entire life and her family has come from there in many generations before, it's like a betrayal to have her son go off. And so that's very, very hard for her to deal with and she's got the kind of personality that has rubbed people the wrong way um, many times which is actually fine with Olive, she doesn't much care. And her relationship with her husband with Henry, her husband, which Henry goes is, through the book. Right, and her relationship with Henry is um, a complicated one as long marriages are or even short ones but um, <laughs> but Henry is sort of the opposite of Olive, you know, always kind of uh, smoothing things over and, and making sure that they can still survive in their, in their life. He's a pharmacist. He's a pharmacist. And a small town pharmacist small town is pharmacist. All, always um, a point of reference for everybody. Yes, yeah. yes. He knows, of course, a lot of the secrets. I mean, any pharmacist will know certain things. So he's in that position, but he's... 
They all live in Crosby, Maine, right. a small town, and both Abide With Me and Amy and Isabel are also um, small town books. What, why small town? Because I spent my childhood in small town Maine. Um, I will just say that I'm, I'm leaving that as a literary. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm moving my work down to New York in the future. But really? Yes, actually I am. I'm, I finally Is made the leap in the work that I'm doing right now. But Did you get will, a mortgage? Because uh, it's very hard for, for anyone <laughs> yes, to move into the It's very art, hard. Right? <laughs> it's very hard. But we're we're going along here with this new. But but this is sort of I think the probably the last piece of the final um, specifically small town Maine. Kind of a trilogy. Yeah. Come to think of yeah. it. Yeah. It's nice. Exactly in a way. Exactly. So all the characters in this book and in all your books are faced with disappointments and setbacks. What are some of the ways in which the characters in Olive Kitteridge deal with these problems? There's a girl who has stopped eating as a part of her anxiety. Um, and then there's Olive, who, who does, throughout the course of the book, lose her son, lose her husband, and yet hangs on. I mean, you have to hand it to her, I think. She's pretty gritty. She's very, very gritty, and in that way, quite admirable. And she just hangs on, and she gets through, and she, of all people, finds and decides to take another shot at love, which is pretty amazing. Are you asking, do you think in, in your, all of your books, but particularly in Olive Kitteridge, your readers to sympathize more with women than with men? Oh, I don't feel that way at all. Um, Tell me. I, I, would, I don't feel that way. Um, no, I think Henry Kittredge is a, a much more sympathetic, in many ways, character than Olive from um, certain behavioral points of view, but I, no, I don't, I don't have any sense of who, who's more sympathetic or not. Um, Abide With Me was about a male minister, and um, uh, so, you know, Amy and Isabel was pretty specifically female, mm -hmm. but no, I'm not asking, I'm just asking for them to hopefully become engaged with the people. Meg, your, your book, The Ten Year Nap, I would ask the same question of you. Um, more sympathy for women than for men, or? The book is very female heavy. It's about a group of women, um, each of whom has stopped working when her children uh, were born and then never has gone back. But, so it's a female world, and in that sense, there is more focus on the women, but I feel very compassionate toward the men as well. Because while the women in my book sort of get to think, do I want to work, do I not, uh, the men never get to ask that of themselves. They're kind of the schleppers. They're sort of going along and going working at the bank or the advertising agency or whatever it is. And they're never asked, do I enjoy this? It never occurs to them. The way that the women deal with this decision, do you feel that it is a matter of conscious choice or is my reading correct, that namely that it's sort of <laughs> choices made for them? I think it's a combination of both. I grew up really thinking that uh, everyone would find their passion, everyone would find what they wanted to do and what they loved to do and could do well. That's not true for everyone, really, and I didn't understand that. I always knew what I wanted to do, that I wanted to be a writer, but what if you don't love your work? We have this assumption that work is this thing that everyone must do and should do, but it, um, once you have children and you leave the workforce for a while, the idea of going back to a job that maybe you never loved or that never loved you is much more complicated, and I started to realize that. Uh, so it kind of changed how I viewed it. The, the, I would say the main character is Amy, um, mm -hmm. although all four women um, are given their due. Uh, she was a lawyer, um, and she sort of uh, drops out uh, of the workforce. And she's a good friend with Jill, another of the characters involved. She also makes friends, new friends, with a new woman named Penny, and Jill becomes jealous. The relationships among these women are not always even, nor are they meant to be. Well, there's this notion, I think, that women's fiction, a phrase that I don't like, that in women's fiction we're supposed to like everyone. We're supposed, er, it's supposed to kind of feel like people you want to spend all your time with. As in life, I think that someone can be annoying, someone can be a little difficult, and there is a kind of imbalance, and there, you know, friendships wax and wane. And when you have children and your own family, uh, your own loyalties, friendships sometimes change. And uh, I wanted to explore that a little bit 
they become friends with this woman, Penny, who I think really Amy has a kind of transference toward. I mean, that's sort of the way I view it. This woman seems to have what we all thought we would have. She's uh, very smart, she's very pretty, and she has a job, the kind of job that in a novel you're supposed to give someone to indicate that they're smart, which is she runs a small museum. And, you know, or else you make them an urban planner. She also has an affair. I she mean, once oh, yeah, again, I was about to say. the infidelity light motif comes in as it does in, in Mark's book. Um, well, I felt that, I mean, I, want, I gave her an affair because I wanted everyone else to sort of revolve around the idea of this person and her life and the excitement that maybe they have put aside in their own lives. Because there is a lot of the domestic life that is about stillness, that is about sameness. And when you hear that someone else has broken away from that, you have a lot of fantasies about what their life is really like. Nevertheless, um, the tenure nap, the title, means to me that it's a temporary thing. The title was a little tricky. Um, some people have felt that I'm sort of casting aspersions on the idea of pulling back from work. I'm really not. I feel great charity for these <laughs> characters. Um, but I do think it's a temporary thing in that I'm writing not about should you stay home with children or work, but what happens when the children no longer need you in that intense way? Ten years have gone by. They have their own cohort. You're not uh, physically required there. They're out in the world because you've, you've done your motherhood job right. Now what? So it's that ten-year period, really, uh, in which you've established your family, your children are off in the world. I think women, regardless of what they then decide to do, have to kind of take stock and think, do I want to return to something I once did? Do I have a passion to do something? Do I just like my life and I can afford it the way it is? On the other hand, a uh, Amy's husband, Leo, his puppetry career takes off, I think, unexpectedly. Do I have this well, right? Well, it's actually another age? character. Uh, it's Roberta's husband, Roberta's Nathaniel. Husband. But, um, and his career takes off after years of being in limbo when he's 50. I just want to ask you how much the role of happenstance plays when you're writing this novel or any novel, when you come on the idea of luck or randomness? Randomness is a really interesting thing to write about because so much of life is that way. And in novels, you have a plan and you set it out for yourself and you start, something can happen in which you feel uneasy about the choices you've made as a writer and you want to be a little freer. And often when I change the direction, it's because I it, I, I'd rather let myself be kind of bumped along with the current a bit. And that does happen in these people's lives. When he gets success, it alters their marriage. But I didn't know when I started writing that that would happen to him. Right. Mark Sarvis's book, um, Harry Revised, um, is about the efforts of a more or less beginning middle-aged uh, widower to come to terms with the loss of his wife and himself. And boy, the heart and head are far apart. Yes, yes, they are. He can't get out of his head long enough to figure out what's in his heart. And then when he does, it confuses what's back in his head. So, what's so, What can you kind of, in a nutshell, tell us the Harry's story? And it's the story of a, of a recently bereaved widower who is seeking to reinvent himself. And he sort of has realized that he is not the man he wanted to become either. Um, but the way that he sets about doing it's a bit wrong-headed, a bit feckless. He, um, draws his inspiration from Edmond Dantes, the Count of Monte Cristo, and, and launches on these series of what he hopes will be perceived as selfless acts, although they're not. He has an agenda to them, and gets himself progressively into more and more trouble. And the more trouble he gets into, the more his, his reckoning becomes forced. So, um, It's a lot about deception and truth and lies. And again, it, it to some extent, characterizes much of fiction and some of poetry. Sir Walter Scott writes, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Yes. Can you talk about Harry's tangled web sure. a little bit specifically? Yeah, well, th there's a moment actually early on in the book where Harry um, has, is having one of his first conversations with the waitress Molly, who is sort of the object of his affection, and he tells sort of a white lie, and he thinks to himself, sort of the old maxim of keep your lies close to the truth, it's, it's easy to keep straight. But what happens throughout his story and throughout his relationships is he tells a lie and then you find, as you inevitably do, you have to tell another lie to cover that lie and another lie still, and they tend to snowball, and that's when he gets himself out of trouble. So part of this story is about a character who's learning how to tell the truth because he, 
he hasn't had the, the nerve to do it. You think it's possible? Yeah, I was going to say. Do you think it's possible oh. to tell the truth? <laughs> there's oh, a, gosh. There's an interesting Sodium pentafall. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's certainly the question of how we define the truth and what the truth is yeah. to us. It's, it's a fungible... You, I'm sorry, I thought you were going to say it's a story about a man who's learning how to lie correctly. <laughs> <laughs> and and but, he, there's yeah, some of that, that too. The truth, there's some of that too, yeah. It's a fascinating question, especially since we're talking about fiction. Uh, and I just finished um, Which Cynthia Ozick's marvelous true. new collection. And at the very end, in the last line of the last story, which has to do with Esperanto and other languages, one of the characters basically says that the only universal is the language of the lie that, that, that we tell. So that there's probably some truth to that, which sounds paradoxical, but it isn't. So. There's, a, there's a line um, that is sort of... Um, takes into account some of this uh, right at the beginning. Um, Harry's thinking, um, and it's right near the beginning, I guess, where he's going in to the diner because he's in love with Molly at a distance and wants to make time with her. Right. He says, um, there's an excellent chance that this unplanned lunch stop is going to make him late, and although he minds, he can't quite bring himself to forego the stop. He notes this, it registers that he ought to mind, and he wonders why he doesn't. He does this a lot, this strange, circular thinking. Does he think too much? Absolutely. And I guess that would lead to the question, is it possible to think too much? And I, I'm not sure I know a writer Don't who guess would my question. Answer, the, answer that it's not. So yes, he thinks way too much. And, and I think part of what happens in the course of his journey is he comes out of the place of thinking and a little bit more into the place of action. So. Mm. But yes, he, he gets lost in his thoughts. The book works backward, basically, toward what happened between him and his wife a long time ago. Let me ask first, why did you choose that chronology? Because I, you know, my conceit, and we all have our conceits when we begin and how much they're worth, I'm not sure, other than helping us get to the end. But what I, what I, what I wanted was the notion that Harry's in the immediate shock of the loss of his wife, his memories of his wife would be indistinct. And as he, because he's in essence holding it at arm's length, he doesn't want to experience this. And as he goes through his misadventures, and it forces him more to take this on and to think about it, his past would come into greater focus to us as the readers. So the flashbacks actually unfold in a reverse chronological order. So with any luck, at the moment when Harry has finally figured out what he needs to see, we the reader have, have gotten there with him. And that's the reason for, for having told it that way. Yeah. Sort of the chronological equivalent of peeling an onion in a way. Exactly. And Meg, your book has the uh, women's, maybe even the men's, but I think the women's antecedents, their yes. parents. And that's a, those are flashbacks that are, um, narratively speaking, unconnected. Well, you know, what I set out for myself to do was that all my main characters would not work. And uh, none of them would have a job. And then I wanted to do some short chapters between the long chapters about women from the past who did work. So just sort of little flashes of how we got from there to here, really. Uh, Amy, my main character's mother, is a kind of early feminist, you know, in the 70s. I don't know how early that is, really, but it feels early now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she holds consciousness-raising groups in the house in Montreal. And I wanted to look at how those women thought that the next generation of women would be able to do anything they wanted, and how that hasn't worked out exactly right. Is, is it? Sorry. Is oh, said, no, I was... Is, it, is Amy right to resent her mother's inattention? When she was a child, her mother was off writing historical novels? Yes. And she resents it. I think all children are narcissists, and all children want their parents to be right there. And when the parent shows uh, you know, signs of having a life that the thoughts that don't have to do with the child, I think it can bring out a certain kind of anger in children. I think that's really just sort of across the boards true. No, she's not right um, in the way that parents, that mothers need their lives and that Amy's mother starts to become a writer when Amy's very young and she and her sisters are so sort of shocked at not being the apple of their mother's eye. They, you know, they play games, they play Jane Eyre, and they act out the orphanage scene, the Lowood school scene, because they feel sorry for themselves in a way that I think children do. But there was a real tension at that time, you know, in the 1960s, 1970s, really, between um, doing what you wanted to do for yourself and being able to raise children for women. And I wanted to explore that. 
I have a feeling that poems are, are more like people than novels are. I don't mean to say one's better than the other. I mean the way at all, but I mean the way to, <clears throat> that, a not, that a poem is like we're all here in one place. You can see all of me at the same time mm -hmm. and you can hear me and then you can begin to kind of unravel me as I can with you. But a novel is more sprawling and it's more... Well, it's interesting you compare a poem to a person that way because I would say, yes, a poem is more like a person in an immediate sense, but in the same way that sometimes you need to know people over time, that's what fiction gives you that poetry doesn't. It gives you this long temporal experience. Right, right. And so that's another kind of it's replication kind of, of yes. real life. You, you could say that you love a novel even if it has no shapeliness to it. It's hard to say that I think about a poem. I, I, there's some novels you just become so excited about the language you're willing to let the person go on and on and on. Whereas other novels, like my favorite novel is Mrs. Bridge. And that is such really? a sort of, oh, I love that novel. Really? I think about it all the time. And it has these little sort of epigrammatic sections. And the whole novel feels like a perfect length. It's small and sort of, you see the again, container of it so perfectly in a way that you often don't in novels. Mm -hmm. I sometimes feel like with a very long novel, I'm so thrilled because it will go on and on. It will be a blur of pleasure mm -hmm. for me. Right. I and felt that way with totally Underworld when I read The Little is Underworld. And that was actually one of the first novels that gave me the sense that I might write a book of my own one day, not to put myself remotely on that level, but I got the sense of what the novelist was doing, how he was building this thing. And, and, and I had many, many pages to go along with him in, in which to find that. And I had that same experience of wanting more pages to keep coming. So. One of the things that really struck me in reading your three books was it really struck me as the way that fiction is different than poetry. And one of the ways, because we're also talking about the ways they're, they're alike, but one of the ways that they struck me as different is it seemed to me there was a tremendous amount of social information in fiction in each of your books. I mean, I, you learn a lot about the way women of a certain age live now in relationship to children. You learn around a lot about the milieu, maybe not the, the, the work milieu of Harry, but you do learn a lot about a diner and what it looks like, or in one chapter, what a, what a bicycling class looks like <laughs> so class, intensely. Yeah. And in your work, you learn so much about a small town in Maine and how it operates. And I sort of envy that kind of social information that you get in fiction, which you don't get in the same way in poetry. You also lose something, I think, which is a certain kind of intensity, an absolute intensity of feeling, which you can get by the compression of poetry, which is much harder to get in fiction because it's taking but, place over time. But, but at the center, at the crucial passages in fiction, you do get you some of the, that same It's charge. very much like poetry yeah, in those it, moments. It, it but gets, it could feel buried in all the information. I mean, that's one of the problems. I guess my goal in, in finding the perfect book to read would be one that had a lot of information that was very interesting but didn't shy away from some emotional core. And uh, I guess when you write a novel, it's almost as though you write everything you know at the time. And maybe it feels that way. Um, right. I guess I'm, I'm really, that's one of the reasons that I'm so interested in the sound of sentences because I want the sentences, even in fiction or a short story or a novel, I want the sound of those sentences to, be, to carry the weight right. of the emotion. Maybe, I mean, there, there are all kinds of poems, all kinds of novels, but I'm getting the impression that there are short novels that are almost more like poems, that they are in a, I mean, Pride and Prejudice, I think of being as a kind of a perfect book, but some of the long, more long Victorian novels, not so much. Um, so they're different experiences. You, Ed, your poem, Second Story Warehouse, which is probably too, a little too long to read, unfortunately, but can you tell what the real life circumstances were and what you took away from that job? Um, sure, it's about, it's about working at a factory where I worked when I was a teenager. Um, my father sold boxes and uh, I sometimes worked in the warehouse and it's about, it's, it, the poem is a memory of, uh, of my experience when I was a teenager and um, both I came from the suburbs and I was working in a very gritty city place and I was reading Pablo Neruda for the first time and the world that I came from and the world that my father worked was all in conflict and turmoil and it, the poem is about an apprenticeship in a way to a worker there and what I learned from him basically it's about someone I meet who worked in the warehouse and sort of showed me the ropes he was also from a different world. He was from the Puerto Rico or the Caribbean? Totally. Carib he's Puerto Rican. Mm. He's Puerto Rican. And most of the people working in the factory 
were Puerto Rican. And so there I was, a kid who was not Puerto Rican, but there I was. I wasn't working in the front office with my father. I was working in the back. Right. And this guy sort of takes me under his wing. And um, there's a girl. Right. She takes me under her wing, too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, really, it's, 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 it's really about going through an experience and what you, right. what you learn. As you as you apprentice yourself to this to this factory you know, job, the, the, it's now I also begin to see that some the four works have in common a theme a theme of work. Um, you know, Harry doesn't talk much about being a radiologist, no. nor do you. No, why not? Um, I, I suppose the clear answer is I don't know much about radiology. <laughs> uh, well, that's a good reason. But in, in, in fact, that was one of I have a great group of writers who help me in my workshops, as I imagine we all do. And as I was struggling with what to make him, and he wasn't uh, a radiologist at first, and we discussed it, we sort of like this image that I began playing with of, you know, Harry's a guy in the dark, and he really is in the dark, and, and it seemed to work well. But I, I didn't want to write a novel that ended up be taking too much into the workplace, because really the emotional core of the story, what's happening to Harry in this compressed period of time which this unfolds, is happening elsewhere. So I, I felt it was important to root it, to give it a sense of what he does, but I, I didn't want to spend too much time in the office, and that was a, a conscious decision. In fact, I'm struggling once again with what occupation to give a new character, and mm -hmm. I find that that doesn't come easily. But Architect. Architect. Let me make a suggestion. This is the fallback of many novelists <laughs> and it's many the screen... Slant, you get the slanted table. <laughs> that really helps. Maybe that's it. But I know, and I've always thought, ever since I saw 12 Angry Men, in mm -hmm. which Henry Fonda is on the jury and plays an architect, I noticed that architects crop up in fiction a lot. Well, People take don't want to write about actual work in novels, I've noted. I mean, the Joshua Ferris novel is mm -hmm. an exception where you actually see right. work in an extended way. But I think writers sometimes like to sort of say what the job is and then don't want to actually... Put get in into the time. it. Yeah, that's interesting. It's, the it's, the it's, workplace it's, novels are unusual. Um, uh, Something happened. The Joseph Heller novel. The first half right. of it is brilliant. It's about, terrific. Brilliant book. about a workplace. Horrifying. Oh, I, yeah. I love that. I'm, I'm interested yeah. in workplaces. I mean, Isabel you, was a secretary in, in a factory, and it's right in there. But it, in that you did workplace. that's really unusual. And then Abide with Me is about a minister, and I had to learn a lot about what it felt like to be a minister right. because I was intrigued with the what that job would be like. And it's, so I'm and it's really places. important that Olive Kitteridge, Olive Kitteridge is an ex-teacher. She's an ex-school teacher. Well, she's a retired school teacher. Retired. She did it all her life. And she learned a great deal about human nature by having these adolescents coming. You know, at some point, I think she, she mentions that she, she taught school long enough to know that a great, a large degree of insecurity could uh, manifest itself as somebody being un seeming unintelligent right. and and she just she's she understands some of her of some it. of her students recycle back into her life yes absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. it's also so. a neglected subject in poetry i mean there are a few work. Poet work. work well that's What's one it? of the reasons i picked out the the, the one in wor about work in your poem because yeah, it was seemed mean, exceptional it, it, i mean there are a couple of poets who spent a lot of time philip levine is one who spent a lot of time in creating the workplace and what that is but i think work has been really neglected by american poets I and apparently Hall's by fiction like work. Work. Yeah. yeah it's not poetry yeah. but it's yeah. a wonderful yeah. wonderful his thoughts on mm -hmm. work and it, the role in, in our lives. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. When you write your nonfiction, which is wonderful, especially Thanks. how to read a poem, Thank you. Um, do, are your habits different? They must be. I think, yes, they are. Because we're talking about the contrast here and method and so on. Uh, I think that when you're writing a, a long book, that like how to read a poem, um, a long book of criticism or love is, is what how to read a poem is, is my passion for poetry. It's a little bit like more like the work habits of a novelist. I mean, you just, I can't imagine a novelist who just wanders around for many hours and then something, you know, occurs to him or her. No, and then I, don't, sits down. I think so. Oh, really? Naipaul really? says that yeah. more than eight, seven eighths of his work is done away well, from Well, there's the a lot power. of daydreaming, but I th it strikes me that it, you need to sit at the desk for a certain number of hours a day. Right. At least that was the case for me when I was writing How to Read a Poem. Right. Um, although I have to say, my own methods in writing in writing criticism are a little closer to poetry than maybe most critics because it's still very determined by inspiration, passion, by um, what I care most about and I still tend to, to, to work in not necessarily the most productive way which is I tend to just drive through when I'm on something and I just work all the time around it and then other times it's a little more fallow. I don't have a, I don't have a temperament of great equilibrium.
And so I don't just, I'm not very steady. I just, once I get an idea, I really stick, I, I just, you know, stick with it and won't let it go. And I wrote a lot of how to read a poem and it kind of surged that way. When did you know that you were a poet or were going to be a poet? Um, I started writing poetry when I was in high school, but I would not call myself a poet. I would say that I began writing with, um, out of emotional desperation. I had feelings that I just couldn't control, and somehow writing poetry um, made me feel better. But I would say that I was, a, 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 I was expressing myself. But when I was a freshman in college, I went to Grinnell College, and I had a teacher named Carol Parsonen, and she began, um, she did a wonderful thing. I started showing her my poems, and she began to, um, to, to comment on them. And what she did was she somehow was able to communicate to me that I could be a poet, that I had the passion for a poetry, for poetry, I had the intelligence for poetry, but that what I was writing was not poetry. It was just self-expression. And I, she began to give me things to read, and I began to read. And um, I read John Donne, I read John Keats, I read Gerard Manley Hopkins. And somewhere in my freshman year at college in 1968, I began to try to imitate what I read. And I tried to actually shape something. I tried to make something like a poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins. And I really think that, that when I began to try to make something, I was on my path towards becoming a poet. And somehow, sometime between being a freshman and a sophomore in college, I decided that this was my path. That mm -hmm. poetry, I believe that poetry is a vocation, not a career. And but somewhere I decided this was my vocation. I'm just curious, you seem to read a lot of poetry, am I right? Yes, yeah. I do. I read a lot of poetry. and I've Because you seem secretly, to respond to the secret. Um, well, I, I, I don't, I've always thought very highly of Let me just, poets uh, and poetry. <laughs> <laughs> always. I think something like 70% really? of adult Americans have written poetry. Oh, I've not wow. written it. I, I just yeah. love it. Yeah. I just read it. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. It is. It is. I, I wonder, you use the word vocation. My feeling is that people who are writers, at the time they decide to be writers, think that they're choosing to. And later on, they look back and see that it wasn't a choice. It, they, it was choosing them. It was choosing them. Is that the way? Yeah, I had to do it. I've had, yeah. to, I've had to do it my whole yeah. life. It's, you know, I always think that it, it sounds pretentious to anyone who's not a writer who doesn't do it to express this notion of, I have to, I have to. And they look at you and they're like, oh, come on, no, you don't. <laughs> and if you're not inside the skin of someone who is sort of struggling with those urges over a lifetime, it is hard to explain. But yeah, it's very much so. You, you well, can't I mean, rest. You can't it's think. It's made me so happy to, find a, to, to do it, to find a way to sort of squeeze it in, even if I did something else, I would do it. That, also, just one more thing, because now I'm thinking that Ed has sort of planted a seed here. Desperation. Exactly. I, I don't honestly know how I could bear life without writing. Um, I, mean, I guess that sounds melodramatic, but I, it's certainly a thought that I've had sometimes when I think of people who aren't writers. I've actually thought, how, how did they live? How did they <laughs> deal with was... all the things that come their way? And I will say that there's desperation in all, in all of these books as well, as I guess there Definitely. always is. And, and I think you need that to get you across the long hurdle of finishing a book, because I know many people who would like to write a book, who think they have a book, who have an idea for a book, but to actually sit down and, you know, I, my respect for novelists has grown even greater than it was before, having done it myself and having seen how difficult it is. And I know that no two are alike and that each time you set out, you have to figure out all over again how to do it. And yet we keep coming back and we keep doing it. And that must speak to something but, that's but that pushing statistic you. statistic of 70% is extraordinary <clears throat> because it suggests that really almost everyone at some point in his or her life is so overwhelmed by something that he or she is experiencing that th that person needs to try and write it down. It's not enough just to feel it, but some exactly. loss, right. some joy, some ecstasy, some agony. Most are love poems. Mostly love poems. Right. I'm not surprised. Right. But it's and not enough to keep it in. And it you somehow need to yeah. try and find language for it. Now, what I would like to do is to make that bridge for those 70% of the people to understand mm -hmm. that if they read, exactly. they can get right. something of exactly. the same hit 
Right. It's something of the same feeling. It's something exactly. of the same consolation articulated right. by authors. And if those writers became readers, literature would be in a much healthier place yeah. in the United States. Because I don't States. think you and could so say seventy percent yeah. of yeah. people read poetry. You know, that would be an amazing yeah. statistic. You do the I, same problem with fiction writers. I know too many fiction writers who are writing and who don't read. You know, they yeah. they. Writers, there's a strange disconnect now there. More than ever to sort of make the case why read. You know, what do you get? And that's yeah. what I feel like we have to sort of wear the sandwich board for fiction or right. poetry. I think of writing, I think of reading as being a little bit like therapy, only in that you do it to yourself in, in solitude or maybe with one other person in terms of any therapeutic thing. But you do it in, actually, not, it's not, a bookworm is not what readers are. It, you do it in order to open out. Right. You go in in order to come out. That's why these books have in common this theme of inside out, of giving people's inner lives and then allowing the readers to go and understand what they see and whom they meet and what they talk about more clearly than they did before. I uh, thank you all for being here and uh, on title page. And uh, just so that I can sort of, uh, the, our most recent um, Poet Laureate of the United States, Charles Simic, and I don't, is that the right pronunciation yeah, of his yeah, name? I've yeah. never said it out loud yeah. before. Yeah, that's it. Has a new book called That Little Something, mm. which seemed to me to be sort of one of the things we ended up talking about here, that one moment that is going to carry that charge. So I thought I would give oh, thank you one very of much. these oh, wow. to each of you. And Excellent. I thank you so much you for being much. here. Thank it's you. a tremendous thank pleasure. You. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks for, and thanks for joining us on Title Page and whatever else you do, keep reading.